it is now evident that scores, possibly hundreds of American architects, are using concrete in startling new ways. But a dozen or more well-known designers, probably due to the respect and confidence they command, have been able to use concrete more times and explore its possibilities further. What is more interesting than the differences between their works, which are wide, are the changes in form that mark each of their succeeding projects. They're no longer recognizable by mannerisms. They create style with each new effort. Although the late Frank Lloyd Wright's latter-day work dates from the mid-1930s, the freshness of his tapered columns and delicate double-curved mushroom tops of the Johnson Wax offices in Racine, Wisconsin, are envied today. His delightful, circular-formed Kalita Humphrey Theater in Dallas, Texas, was an exercise in miniature of the forms, problems, and controversies involved in what was probably his most daring project, the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. This is a strange combination of Wright's early addiction to bold, horizontal masses and his later fascination with circular forms. The smooth-formed conical walls of the gallery coil upward to contain a continuous spiral ramp inside that uncoils downward, permitting the art lover to start with a show of Kandinsky's colorful canvases under the dome and end effortless hours later, dodging mobiles and massive sculpture on the ground floor. Despite the fact that museum experts claim the spiral ramp is not an ideal platform for exhibiting or viewing works of art, all who feel the gentle gravity pull around Wright's ribbons of ramps and railings have an experience of artistic expression in a form they probably never expected. Although Wright died with a dozen unfulfilled commissions on his boards and left a heritage of hundreds of designs no one ever bought, his devoted pupils have successfully carried on his work. The Greek Orthodox Church in Milwaukee, although the lavish decoration around the conoidal thin shell dome is surprising after the unadorned Guggenheim structure, bears enough familiar touches both inside and out to confirm its origins. Seemingly out of the same cast, but stretched mightily, is the vast new Marin County Center near San Francisco. It is a masterly job of concrete forming. Domes, cantilevered shells, complicated openings, incised and sculptured decoration. But some of Wright's old antagonists wish the master were still here to defend himself. The late Aero Saarinen's first major exploration of reinforced concrete was the War Memorial Center in Milwaukee. Located atop a 40-foot cliff overlooking the city and Lake Michigan, he used a fortress-like rectilinear scheme, which included three bold two-story boxes, cantilevered 30 feet from triangular columns. The interior court is a platform for viewing the lake and providing access to the cantilevered areas which contain offices, meeting rooms, museum, and library. His first thin shell was a dome, one-eighth of a sphere its sides cut by an inverted pyramid to provide three light walls and supporting legs. The Kresge Auditorium Dome at Massachusetts Institute of Technology is three and a half inches thick at the apex and 24 inches at the legs. Feeling this form was too earthbound, Saarinen made his TWA terminal at John F. Kennedy Airport, New York, appear to soar. Not a thin shell, but four interlocked vaults which act on surface resistant principles the spreading on four strong Y-shaped columns squatting on the ground. The intersecting vaults, entwining columns and large slots for lighting, create the impression of great space enclosed by massive sculpture. Saarinen soared even higher at Dulles International Airport, Washington, D.C. His terminal building is a compact 40 by 160 feet, 
with a hammock-like roof of thin concrete slabs suspended on cables. The cables are secured by great flaring columns leaning out to carry the load. Columns on the approach side rear 65 feet high and are 40 feet high on the field side. The interior is one continuous open area, its glass enclosed walls steeply canted to match the flare of the columns. Saarinen also designed the motor lounges which carry passengers from the flight departure deck directly to the plane. A visitor to the Yale University campus said, this can't be Yale, and is certainly not Saarinen. He was talking of the two undergraduate dormitory complexes designed by Saarinen a couple of years before his untimely death. They are groups of high and low buildings, sharply angular in plan and arranged on different levels. Their walls are unlike any concrete Saarinen used before, being granite quarry scraps, three to eight inches in diameter, packed into wood forms and filled cement sand grout. The surfaces were brushed to reveal the strong aggregate texture. The monastic severity of the angular vistas between buildings and along parkways is relieved by a score or more abstract concrete sculptures by Constantin Novello. Rectilinear forms dominate the growing volume of recent concrete projects by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. But the generally familiar overall shapes have unusual details and are achieved with very original uses of concrete as a structural material. The freestanding frame to produce peristyler structures is used in two very different offices for the John Hancock Mutual Life Insurance Company. At Kansas City, the peristylar frame is made of massive precast cruciform units combined to form a load-bearing grid four feet in front of the glass wall which encloses interior spaces. At New Orleans, the precast frame elevated above ground level comprises column members eight inches by three feet deep and five inch by three feet eyebrow sunshades. columns support the outer edges of the floor slabs. Smooth finished surfaces are used for both types of precast units. Near Hartford, Connecticut, SOM produced a startlingly long, low silhouette to fit the rolling site chosen for the new offices of the Emhart Manufacturing Company. The offices are enclosed in a 336 by 378 foot single story rectangle supported on a forest of concrete trees surrounding an interior garden plaza. The trees are cast in place columns and radiating ribs spaced to permit ample sheltered parking and free movement of vehicles under the roof slab. Floor and roof slabs and the columns which separate them are faced with two inch thick precast panels with exposed gray granite aggregate. You can almost always spot a concrete job by Minoru Yamasaki, not by any particular form or use of the material, but because he always lets so much light into his buildings. This was true of his first large concrete commission, St. Louis Airport where short barrels intersected to form great groined vaults were peeled open to permit large areas of patterned roof lighting. He employed a system of folded slabs for the floors and roof of McGregor Conference Center at Wayne University, Detroit. The ends are exposed outside and inside as ornament. They're folded forms dictating the frame of the large roof opening that floods the interior with natural light. His headquarters for the American Concrete Institute, Detroit, is a lavishly ornamental demonstration of some of the new forms and products possible in concrete. 
Its interior is illuminated by grill walls and a wide strip light running the length of the folded roof. The science building at the recent Seattle Fair employs modified Gothic forms of pre-stressed and pre-cast concrete in soaring vaults of fine tracery, sculptured wall panels, and long screens fancifully arranged around a water landscape of pools and fountains. Rest areas are sheltered by cantilevered slabs with coffered reflecting surfaces. Yamasaki's first skyscraper, a 32-story office building for Michigan Consolidated Gas Company, Detroit, is a great light well of floor-to-ceiling fenestration. Its occupants are screened from direct sun glare and agoraphobia by deep precast mullions and narrow vertical panels of white quartz aggregate. Tall, shell-like columns unfold as they rise and spread into delicately curved, thin forms for the roof of Yamasaki's Congregation Israel Temple in Glencoe, Illinois. Spaces between the graceful roof members will be patterns of glass which both illuminate and emphasize the form and structure of the building. Marcel Brewer, one of the first graduates of the Bauhaus, has turned to reinforced concrete in a variety of forms in his recent American work. The roof and walls of St. John's Abbey, Collegeville, Minnesota, were shot by a cement gun against rough wood forms and sheathed with thin granite aggregate panels. The main facade is a honeycomb of large precast hexagons filled with colored slab glass. Instead of a tower or spire, he devised a broad, rough-cast bell banner, a freestanding sculpture that reflects sunlight into the north-facing screen wall. His library for Hunter College in New York is an arrangement of six large inverted hyperbolic paraboloids. Its high window walls are protected by a screen of common chimney blocks. floating, gravity-defying block, which startles everyone who first sees his new conference and lecture hall at New York University, shows early Bauhaus influence. But his abandonment of the familiar ribbon windows is part of a personal revolt against the layer cake facades of conventionally storied buildings. The noted city planner and project designer, I. M. Pei, used small but deep precast curtain wall units for the Denver Hilton, part of a fine urban complex which includes a large hyperbolic paraboloid umbrella as entrance gallery to a department store. His twin Kipps Bay apartments in New York City are cast in place using large concrete frames as bearing walls. This is one of many of Pay's successful housing projects all over the country. Edward Stone, who created an architectural sensation with the precast concrete solar grill, has used this functional and decorative device in a startling variety of ways, from great screens of small grill units entirely enclosing a dormitory at the University of South Carolina, to the 300-foot-long colonnade of the Stanford Medical Center at Palo Alto. Here, he used large grill panels in a design of Mayan origin for high screen front window areas and courtways, and repeated the same designs in Talio in adjacent solid concrete walls and columns. His latest grills are eight stories high, tiers of cast in place concave faced concrete arches used as bearing walls on all four sides of the perpetual savings and loan building in Beverly Hills. These continuous grills of lightweight concrete are cast two feet in front of the window walls 
and thus serve as sunscreens. Plastic form liners produced a smooth, high density texture. All surfaces were later painted. Far different from Stone's romantic decoration is the hard, functional emphasis Louis Kahn gives his reinforced concrete. None can fail to understand the structure of his Philadelphia medical buildings. For his Yale Art Center, he used a floor system of concrete tetrahedrons left exposed as rough textured coffered ceilings. All column and wall concrete is exposed, bearing the undisguised marks of the wood strip forms. All the new forms possible in concrete seem to spark the imagination of Gio Obata, brilliant designer of a busy St. Louis firm. His Benedictine Priory is a surprising arrangement of two levels of thin, double-curved barrels which intersect to form a circular auditorium. This chapel in the round is illuminated by the open ends of all barrels. Atop the many-curved dome is a lacy tower of thinner and more sharply curved barrels which support a small carillon of bells. He chose a dome of double conical section, producing a hyperbolic silhouette to enclose the spherical projection dome of the new St. Louis Planetarium. The flaring thin shell is supported on 12 piers. The glass perimeter wall is moved back from the edge supports to provide a sheltered walkway around the building. Although much of his upcoming work will involve concrete shells, including one project of tilt-up hyperbolic paraboloids, Obata is equally at home with more conventional forms, such as the Blue Cross Blue Shield building and Lindell Terrace apartments, which are exposed concrete frames with precast curtain wall elements. The complicated roof structure, barely visible above the solidly enclosed concrete walls of Temple Israel, is the exciting feature of Obata's latest work. It is a series of diagrid beams forming hexagons and triangles which support folded concrete forms and skylights. The filler units are sculptured with Stars of David and pyramid designs. Wallace Harrison and Max Abramovitz have been partners in many projects which resemble each other only in that they are reinforced concrete. Their deeply shadow patterned walls of Wachovia Bank Building in Charlotte, North Carolina are made up of 3,800 precast units, crowned at the center of each panel and staggered in position to present one of the most memorable facades in current architecture. The nave of Harrison's fish-shaped Presbyterian Church in Stamford, Connecticut is a great folded concrete space frame pierced into a thousand open forms from base to ridge of the roof. The openings are filled with chipped cathedral glass, which create the impression of endless walls of color. In an odd way, the form Max Abramovitz selected for the New York Philharmonic Building at New York's Lincoln Center is more closely related to the Greek Parthenon than to any contemporary structure. But, Instead of double rows of massive Doric columns supporting heavy sculptured entablature, its peristyle is a double row of slim, tapered concrete columns topped by a flat slab and finished with a thin facing of travertine. Its bank of cantilevered balconies fronting the high window wall, of course, is modern structural concrete. For his alma mater, University of Illinois, Abramovitz has created a dramatic, modern concrete form. The 16,000-seat assembly hall is a vast bowl sunk halfway into the earth, resting on 48 outflaring radial buttresses. The outer rim is a pre-stressed concrete tension ring, which carries the thrust of the 400-foot diameter segmented and curved folded plate dome. The thin shell of the dome was cast in orange peel segments on forms pivoting from a temporary center column then given a waterproof skin before it was painted white. 
it is a spectacular setting for sports, musical, and theatrical events. demonstrates the unlimited approaches that can be taken to successful concrete design. His Sarasota, Florida high school was a significant departure in modern school planning. A neat, efficient organization of space separates and dramatizes the dominant structural features, overlapping roof slabs, catwalks, and hanging precast sunscreens. Its articulated elegance contrasts with the plastic unity of Rudolph's New Haven parking garage, a rough-molded, five-decked monolith sprawling over two downtown blocks. Columns, slabs, ramps, and railings are cast integrally against plain wood forms and left exposed as they came from the mold. Rudolph's current preference for rough textured concrete is dramatically expressed in his Arts and Architecture Center at Yale. This vigorous composition, accenting vertical and horizontal structural elements, has pocked and striated wall surfaces. They were cast against forms with parallel inserts to produce vertical fins, which, 20 hours after the concrete was placed, were knocked off with a claw hammer, exposing the coarse aggregate. Probably the most surprising of Rudolph's many unusual but eminently livable houses is this concrete block home for Arthur W. Milam near Ponte Vedra, Florida. Its open sculptural exterior is dominated by a powerful composition of rectangular frames used as a broad sunscreen. These lines are carried inside where the floors are arranged on seven different levels. It cannot be denied that the new concrete has been a dominant factor in the current revolution in architecture. This is probably the first time a creative art has been so liberated and stimulated by discovery of the new potentialities of a material or medium of expression. What lies ahead? One path along the future of concrete is projected by Paul Rudolph in this model for an exposition center. The fanciful filigree disc suspended high in the air on its massive pylon can be easily, if not cheaply, assembled and erected from fabricated units of precast and pre-stressed concrete. But numberless other ideas, bolder still and yet unborn, are the future of concrete in American architecture. 